is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for week number eight in the NFL by talking to Drew Dinzik. Whale Cap, we're going to swing by and give his thoughts on the biggest games this week, including the Steelers against the Ravens. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. And Ed, it's pretty easy to get pumped about a week in the NFL. We get a, a fun game like Steelers versus Ravens on the slate. So how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I mean, that's the game that is going to make me be on time at 1 p.m. Uh, <laughs> for uh, for where I usually go watch these games with some friends on uh, on Sunday. So, yeah, I mean, just an excellent matchup. I mean, you know, can Lamar Jackson get it done? You know, yeah. uh, numbers really haven't been there in terms of the passing game. Two great defenses, uh, stuff that we'll all get into later in the show. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to get into it with Drew Dinzik. Find him on Twitter at whale underscore capper. He, of course, is the host of the Deep Dive podcast. We had Andy Molitor on a couple weeks ago. He is uh, Drew's co-host there on the Deep Dive podcast. We're going to preview week eight with Drew, get his thoughts, of course, on Steelers versus Ravens, many other games, and talk about some future bets as well. If you are tuning in for the first time this week, we also had Eli Hershkovich on yesterday to preview week number nine in college football. You can find that discussion by searching for for covering the spread wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you are subscribed to get uh, notifications as we go live each and every week uh, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever it may be. You can find us, and if you like what you hear from Eli, Drew, or either of us, make sure you leave a rating and review as well. We're going to get into Week 8 in just a second, but first we got to go back to last week. We had John Sheeran on to preview Week number 7, and John had some good thoughts on those games. Covering the past. All right, last week here on Covering the Spread, we had John Sheeran, the director of trading at FanDuel Sportsbook, to preview week seven. Make sure you follow John on Twitter at jsheeran1981. And John showed us why he is in the position that he is because John had a good week. He thought the Steelers were the right side of their game with the Titans. And he apparently was uh, having that discussion with the, the staff at FanDuel Sportsbook. He favored the Steelers, they favored the Titans, so they had it at minus one and a half. And he had the, the Steelers tight. plus one and a half. Yeah, he he had he disagreed with them. He thought it was Steelers' side, and he was right. The Steelers got a huge lead early in that game and pulled out the win outright. I know the Titans battled back, but hey, you know, John, uh, hopefully he was able to gloat a bit in the office on Monday about that one. John also was on the Rams, minus six over the Bears. The Bears did almost claw their way back, but the Rams won that one pretty comfortably. So another win for John there. And Ed, I know the Bears were a team you had backed the previous week. Did you yeah. have anything on them against the Rams as well or no? Oh, yeah. I mean, I bet them against the Rams. Um, you know, after the show, we talked a little bit and I was yeah. like, look, I think the Bears offense. I Sorry, I think the Bears. Oof, I think the Bears defense is, is great. And, yeah. um, you know, they look really good in my numbers. I still have my doubts about the Rams, even though that they, you know, they've been a great team. Like how, how much can we get off our preseason prior that they were very NFL average? Yeah. And, and I think he accepted those arguments, but, uh, you know, didn't, did not go my way. Um, yeah. Which is fine. Although I did it. My numbers did agree with him uh, that Pittsburgh, uh, my, my numbers had Pittsburgh winning that outright. So yeah, uh, my numbers and John Sheeran, uh, yeah, went, went against his colleagues and, and were on the right side. So. See, John, or see, Ed, the thing you got to account for here is that the Bears' defense is facing future Hall of Famer Jared Goff. You know, you gotta you gotta right. account for that. You had Rob Pizzola on your podcast this week. I've gotta I've gotta bring the good vibes for Jared Goff. I know that Rob is not a fan, so I gotta bring the good vibes. That's my obligatory role here: is to pump up Jared Goff, act as his agent and uh, get him in the Hall of Fame eventually. Uh, finally, both John and I were on the Seahawks, minus three and a half. Woof. Uh, they had a 20 to seven <laughs> lead in the first half. They also led 27, 14. They were up 10 at the half. They were up 10 in the fourth quarter. They promptly blew that lead. They went to overtime. They lost. It was frustrating. I'm not a fan. Uh, I like, I feel so like a tortured soul for having been someone who has previously bet against Russell Wilson and lost. So I was like, oh, cool. I can just bet Russell and not worry about it. But then Russ was the guy who took me down. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. Uh, the Yeah, some of those picks were not. Yeah, it was just very uncharacteristic. And when you need that kind of uh, performance from Russell to uh, for them not to cover and not to win, kind of shows you like, 
the yeah. confidence you might have on this team on a, on a normal basis. Obviously, the defense is, leaves a lot to be desired. Although, you know, I mean, I think you can say a lot of good things about Arizona uh, at this point in the season as well. I mean, they're, yeah, they're kind of maybe inching up into the conversation in a very tough division. Yeah, especially with that defense playing, like, competently, even without Chandler Jones. Like, that's a pretty big endorsement of them because I didn't think the personnel was that great, but they've been playing good football regardless. The other game I had was... Really frustrating, too, because I had the Broncos over 17 points, and they scored a touchdown early. They missed the extra point, and I was immediately like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I hope this doesn't bite me. They finished with 16 points, partially oh. as a result of that extra point. And, like, they played terribly, still got to 16 points. If they had gotten that field goal, I would have pushed. And, like, that's— the extra point. Yeah. If, sorry, if they had gotten that extra point, I would have yeah. pushed— that's two really rough ways to get losses. I've had two yeah. bad weeks, uh, and like, I I think my process may have been off in week six. I feel good about about my process in week seven, but that doesn't make it feel any better. Like right. I'm just annoyed with the way those. Like if I had lost and deserved to lose, cool, whatever. Right. It just stings a little bit more when I lose in that fashion. No, exactly. And like losing Chicago, losing the Chicago game just didn't feel good. I mean, I don't, yeah. I think they played bad and that's not yeah. going to happen every week, but they kind of did get dominated. Right. And that's not, yeah. yeah. Like just, just brutal. Like, come on, man, whatever. Uh, you were on the Texans plus three and a half against green Bay. They actually closed at two and a half. So you actually crossed three there, depending on where you look, uh, depends on the book you look at, but you did cross three there, but the Packers Pulled away early, and the Texans couldn't quite uh, get back into that one. But the movement was good, just not the result. So, tough week uh, for yeah. us here on covering the spread. Yeah, I mean, I, I still think Houston was the right play there. I mean, I, I think there's two two very good teams. The yardage was actually very similar. I know Green Bay piled it on early. Houston a little bit late. Um, but, you know, I mean, Houston, you can see... Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think my process was good for that one. Um, yeah. Pretty happy with it. I'm really praying that they don't trade away their weapons uh, before this deadline. Oh, because you had the over on the team total or the, the win total, right? Oh, that's dead. Oh, <laughs> no, that's, that's long, long been. I dead. guess it was seven and a half, right? Yeah. No, that's long okay. Dead. Well, so, I'm, I'm not worried now, about you that. I'm just like, I like watching Deshaun Watson throw to Will yeah. Fuller. Yeah, that's, that's no, that's true. The rest of the season, I'm going to be sad. You don't want to watch Deshaun Watson throw to Randall Cobb or uh <laughs> Yeah, Randall Cobb's fine. No. But Will Fuller is elite. Uh, yeah, I'd rather I'd much rather wa watch Will Fuller, believe me. Uh, I am right there with you on that one. I am a full endorser of Deshaun Watson, so I fully agree with you there as well. So we gotta bounce back in week number eight. We'll try to do so with Drew Dinzik here in just one second. But first, betting on the NFL is great. Betting on the NFL risk-free is even better. FanDuel Sportsbook is giving you a chance to bet on Week 7 of the NFL risk-free with their exclusive same-game parlays. Simply place a three-leg or more parlay on any NFL Week 8 game to be eligible for the offer and follow along as the game unfolds. If you don't win your bet, FanDuel Sportsbook will refund your bet up to $10 in side credit. What do you have to lose? Must be 21 plus and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, or Iowa. Refund issues a non withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund $10. Terms apply. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. In West Virginia, call 1 800 Gambler.net. In Indiana, call 1 800 9 with it. In Colorado, call 1 800 522 4700. In Iowa, call 1 800 Bets Off. Let's bring in Drew Dinzik now. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at whale underscore capper and check out the Deep Dive podcast with him and Andy Molitor. We're going to preview week number eight and get Drew's thoughts on Steelers versus Ravens and many more. Covering the present. Let's bring Drew Dinzik into covering the spread to break down week number eight in the NFL. Drew, we have not had you on for a while uh, since I think August. How are you doing today? I'm doing incredible. Can you believe it's almost Halloween? So I know it's, it's wild. Again. Yeah. Like time flies when you can't do anything fun. Uh, yeah. And it's kind of been <laughs> that way now. It's like, it's weird because March felt like it took forever, but it feels like no time has passed from April on. I just don't know if like, we just gotten so used to this or what, but it just feels like time just feels very different right now. Yeah. Yeah. Time is broken in 2020. There's no doubt about that. I mean, Especially 
A lot yeah. of things are broken. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's correct. You know, I just had uh, I just had Rob go on my podcast, and we were talking about the cigar room and oh my goodness in Boston uh, that you how somehow escaped. Uh, I, I will never I'm I must I honestly I think I must have had it in January or something because there's no there's no way that like every well, everyone in that whole place you know I my my thinking is that's just how random this is you can could be. you can shut yourself in a room with at least five guys that definitely had positive tested positive for COVID and you can yeah. come out unscathed you are super super immune I, I went to the Celtics game where Rudy Gobert and the Jazz had it <laughs> we were oh wow right <laughs> behind, we were right behind the Jazz bench. Uh, indoors too obviously at the td garden or whatever they call it now uh and then uh yeah the, the conference was amazing and fun wow. got to meet all those people but we were hanging yeah. out inside uh in a cigar lounge blowing smoke like uh, it was yeah, yeah that was that, that was wild wild any other chances you want to take like any other super spreader <laughs> events you want to go to because clearly this is you're you're bulletproof at this point yeah man i mean it's uh yeah i'm not I'm gonna knock on wood because uh obviously right. it's nothing to joke about I, a lot of right. people a lot of people suffered here but um yeah this is it's all been surreal the entire 2020 has been surreal but nfl's you know the fact that they're the fact that they're crushing through and they're you know we're seven weeks into the season and you know short of a little bit of schedule right. uh you know shuffling we really haven't had any impacts is pretty you know we were we're all pretty uh pretty lucky to yep. uh to have what we have in the nfl and I, I really hope the rest of the season continues and um i'm a little nervous about how some of the players and some of the teams who fall out of the playoff picture um, you know, if they can kind of keep things together and keep people committed to, uh, you know, a safe and you know healthy system, it's uh, that's that's kind of the X factor here coming down the stretch. Yeah, it's always concerning when that when those things happen. I had that same concern with baseball. Uh, thankfully, they were able to avoid it, but football is a tougher game, uh, like physically. So I think that checking out is uh, always a concern there. So let's talk about NFL because we haven't had you on, like we said, uh, since NFL started, and you'd mentioned. Making some tweaks to account for changes in this season, did things play out the way you had expected the first couple of weeks, or have you had to, you know, ditch those priors now that we have the actual data? Yeah, I would go both with, uh, in general, yes. Um, yeah. The kind of the principal hypothesis that I was using to um, adjust priors off of sort of market uh, you know, market available information. Uh, I was lower on teams that had a lack of continuity at the head coach and quarterback position um, and lower on teams that were trying to integrate new defensive backs and wide receivers, especially, especially youth. And so a good example is I was especially low on the Vikings, for instance, coming in because they have all of these, uh, you know, all these rookies on defense that they were trying to integrate. Um, and that ended up being lucrative. Uh, number one, I have some nice, uh, you know, Vikings under tickets in my pocket, uh, which, you know, knock on wood, they get 16 games played and that they can cash those. But uh, even beyond that, um, you know, Green Bay week one money line was a, was a, was one of my favorite plays of the season so far. One of my biggest wins. Um, and, uh, you know, it's 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 it was uh, it was good to capture, uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, continuity issues in terms of handicapping. Um, but then there's been other examples like Carolina, where I expected them to take longer to kind of yeah. find their find their legs. Um, and realistically, by week three, they were like clicking. And that's a huge credit to, you know, Matt Rule and Joe Brady. And, you know, maybe just um, I didn't appropriately uh, have a good rating on a lot of those players um, because they've turned into, you know, a pretty a damn average team. And, you know, the numbers would have told you before the season they would have right. been fighting for the one seed. Yeah, I mean, right. for the um, excuse me, for the uh, for the one, number one pick. Uh, and yeah, here they are, you know, probably, you know, kind of on the outside looking in for the playoff picture, but uh, almost certainly a 500 team this season. Yeah, it's super interesting that it's such a compliment to say that Carolina's league average, which is <laughs> it is, yeah. It is. It's yeah. been a remarkable year for them so far. Yeah. Uh, Drew, what have you been doing with uh, home field? I just ran some numbers that, you know, it's less than a quarter point right now. That's <laughs> oscillated a bunch of different ways with a small yeah. sample size. How, how are you treating yeah. that? Uh, so, first of all, uh, I'd I think uh, it's important to kind of evaluate home field through the framework of um, neutral situations, right? So sometimes you have extreme situations where teams are, uh, you know, they're really in um, especially poor travel 
uh, spots or especially difficult uh, stretches of the schedule from a rest standpoint. And that can sometimes mask what home field advantage really ought to be. Um, but the uh, and it's also important to look at home field advantage in terms of win probability as opposed to points, um, because I would say, you know, two percent win probability added around 50 50 is going to get you two two and a half points. But two percent win probability at, you know, 10 is maybe nothing. <laughs> right. So right. there in some in some cases, depending on what the spread is, uh, the home field advantage bump that I apply through the lens of win probability um, is between, uh, you know, between point, point and a half or, or nothing at all. Uh, and, you know, realistically, in terms of a handicap and in terms of, you know, how I think about, uh, you know, making a wager on a home or away team, I, I'm really not factoring it much at all this season i mean it's it's basically neutral we have what uh you know a year and a half worth of data where um you know the win probability added for a home team is uh you know is effectively zero um so it's it's i think that's real signal and i think it's uh it's you know you can attribute a lot of that to um you know how the nfl has specifically tried to change the way the game is is officiated uh you can attribute a lot of that to how teams are specifically planning and you know and end up implementing their travel uh, and I would not expect that to suddenly turn on a dime and all of a sudden we see home, home teams, you know, you know, uh, you know, regress back to two, two and a half as we come down the home stretch of the season. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Drew, it's a good time to take a look at the futures market. Um, is there anything that stands out to you on FanDuel Sportsbook that uh, you'd like to talk about? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you can look pretty clearly at uh, the records and the data and, and get a f- good feel of what each team ought to be. And I think it's pretty unanimous across the uh, data and analytics and even the odds space that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers ought to be the favorites for the NFC title. I personally see their performance and I see the Rams' performance so far this season as opportunities to regress back into the pack a little bit. Um, I don't think you're going to see the same level of defensive standout defense that we've seen from the Bucks through these seven, eight weeks here. Uh, And, you know, this this is a classic old handicapping maneuver where you just kind of look at a team that is overperforming defensively through eight weeks. And you can say, you know, don't do not count on that team being as good through the you know second eight weeks of of their season. Um, And I would put the Bucks kind of squarely in that category. Rams, too. I mean, both teams. A little thin, you know, a little vulnerable to injury. They haven't really been bitten by the injury bug yet. Rams, especially, you know, that's a stars and scrubs yeah. unit, you know, as, and, and, you know, they, they lose a, a player like Burgess who's playing really well at safety against the bears. And does he matter? I mean, maybe not in, you know, just in terms of, uh, you know, the casual handicap, but, uh, you know, his replacement player may not, you know, may not be, uh, even replacement level just cause the, the way that that team is rostered. So, um, I would say the, the bucks and the Rams, in my opinion, as far as price to win the NFC are too high, which then, you know, you kind of look down to the next tier of teams, teams like the Packers, uh, I'm keeping a very close eye on the on the wire to see if they are realistically in the market for another wide receiver. Um, if they bolster their pass offense, I think that can help um, us help, you know, patch up some of the issues that exist with that defense. Uh, I know that's weird to say it, but uh, the Packers, as currently rostered, um, you can you can run on them, uh, you know, with impunity. If that and, and when when yep. when you come in with a plan to run on them and they still can't stop it, that's a problem. And you saw that in the NFC title game last year. And you know, to the degree that they have a even more dangerous passing offense that counters that because, you know, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be able to gain the lead more effectively and you're not going to be, you know, you you can kind of neutralize the ability to uh, defend the run because your team's not going to be in that game state where they can run. Right. And so it's a weird way of saying, you know, the Packers can, you know, can bolster their offense a bit here um, and, you know, come up, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bump them up in my rankings um, and, you know, them in the ballpark of 10 to one for the Super Bowl is interesting. Um, but, uh, but most, the, the team I'm most interested to buy on right now is the New Orleans Saints and it's not close. Number one, they've kind of fallen down to the middle of the pack in terms of overall team ranking, just based, based on how they've played. I will like point to history and tell you Sean Payton's teams 
start the season slow. This isn't new information. We have a we have plenty of signal that tells us they treat the first four weeks or so of the season as an extended preseason. And, uh, you know, they rounded to form through the middle of the season. Uh, and a lot of what I feel like we, a lot of what we saw even not covering against the Panthers uh, was kind of indicative of Sean Payton from a play calling standpoint, starting to get his fastball. I like their sequencing a lot. I like the way that they've built and rostered this team around Drew Brees and what he's currently capable of. Uh, And realistically, they have three games coming up against Chicago, Tampa, and uh, the third game is escaping me right now, but it's a, it's a realistically tough test. Oh, San Francisco, maybe. Yeah. San Francisco. That's right. Chicago, Tampa, San Francisco, and if they can kind of peek through this stretch and win those three games, they can entirely sweep the rest of the board. They don't go up against another difficult pass defense for the the entire rest of the season. The schedule has broken incredibly lucky for them in terms of who they end up facing towards the end, and now that we know a little bit more about these teams. um, And so I can entirely see a a scenario play out here where the Saints finish 14-2 and or 13-3 and and scoop the number one seed. And, um, you know, it's, it's tough to project whether they'll have uh, you know, fans in stadiums in the playoffs, they probably won't just because, especially because it's indoors down there. Um, but either way, if, if you're ha- if you have Drew Brees in that offense inside, uh, as opposed to having to go to say Lambeau uh, for the NFC title game, I like them a heck of a lot better. So, uh, Saints in the ballpark of uh, seven to one or better uh, for NFC title is uh, probably my favorite look across the futures board right now. I don't think you can touch much in the AFC side of things because uh, the Chiefs are as good as the market thinks. And um, that number is probably only going to get shorter, even if they drop a couple of surprising games. Um, you know, Pat Mahomes is playing at that, you know, at a level that warrants that much respect. Um, and but, but my overall approach, and this was going back to even preseason, um, I'm expecting the Ravens to be in the mix come January, but uh, they have obviously currently their offense is not, you know, they're not flexing the way that we expected whatsoever. Very, very different team offensively than we saw in 2019. Uh, And I don't think, I think it's going to take until probably late November, December before they really start to come together as a unit and play at the same level that we saw last year. And I think that's part of their plan. Honestly, I think they're looking at this as a longer arc and they realize they peaked too early last year and they're going to try to be, you know, in form come December, January. So uh, I'm going to wait and, you know, I'm, I'm quietly hoping that, the Steelers upset the uh, the Ravens this weekend <laughs> and people continue to cool on them because I don't think we're at the low point now. Um, but f- certainly if, uh, if the Steelers look like they're in the driver's seat for the one seed and uh, you know, the chiefs are right there in the conversation with the best quarterback in the NFL, uh, you could start to see that number come down a bit. And I think it's a good buy buy on time uh, before, you know, and again, this all, you got to look at the Ravens schedule. They have, Cowboys, Jags, uh, Giants, and Oof. and Bengals. Four of the last <laughs> five games are against the absolute bottom feeders in the uh, in the NFL. Um, they'll fit the other game in there. I think is is Cleveland, who I think they're obviously they're quite a lot better than as they sure. proved. Um, but uh, so basically, once they get to that part of their schedule, with five games remaining, um, I'm going to hammer the Ravens and uh, hope that they can uh, you know exercise some of the demons of their last couple of playoff runs. Like that. So Drew Dinzik, you've you've talked about Drew Brees. I want to go back to New Orleans. You've talked about Drew Brees and his arm and, and the weakness, and this causes concern for you. Sure. Uh, their past defense doesn't quite look like what it's been <laughs> in the past couple of years. Any cause for concern? I, yeah, I I I honestly I want to give their past defense a little bit of an excuse because they still have talented players. Right. It, it's, they still have, you know, Marshawn Lattimore is, a, is extremely talented player. Marcus Williams is a talented player. They're, they just haven't performed to the level that we've seen in years past. And so it's a little bit of a gamble that they're all of a sudden going to snap out of it and you know, be able to play coverage at the same level that we saw last couple of years. Um, but even more than that, a ton of the, um, you know, specifically, like think of the Ra- Raiders game. Right. They were subject to some absolutely horrific refereeing. That was so lopsided. 
and just in general, right. the gap between them and the next, you know, the next uh, most penalized team is huge. And I, I have a very difficult time thinking that that's something fundamental or, you know, specific about this particular roster that's going to um, last throughout the rest of the season. And, you know, if they, so if they just play a little cleaner or get, you know, games that are officiated a little bit more, uh, neutrally, we'll say, uh, <laughs> then I can entirely see this defense all of a sudden looking a lot better and people are going to look for reasons. Well, why? Well, they have a lot of talent. Uh, Marcus Davenport, you know, came up with the game winning play against the Panthers. You know, he, he's, he, uh, you know, sacked Teddy Bridgewater on third and, uh, you know, medium that would have had a makeable field goal for Joey Sly pushes him back. Joey Sly attempts a 65 yarder and he's a couple inches short, right? Davenport yeah. doesn't make that play. That game probably goes to overtime and who knows if the Saints even and win so um the fact that you're starting to see some of these uh you know key players for the saints making plays is encouraging uh and i'm you know i'm i'm gambling a little bit that uh sure. it's not it's not a, it's a matter of the talent is there and it, it'll manifest as we come down the stretch well you talk about the saints getting better as the year goes along i think the defense is the biggest biggest example of that because it seems like every year they start off slow like that year against uh, ryan fitzpatrick and the bucks they oh, end yeah. up like 40 points at home in that game and then they become one of the best defenses in football like four weeks later great point yeah no it's it, it, i don't have an exa- i don't have an i don't get it <laughs> I right don't understand <laughs> it. Uh, i mean if i'm uh, if I'm Dennis Allen and I'm calling that defense, I'm not like throwing games. <laughs> early in the season. Um, but what, but whatever the case is, maybe it takes them a little bit longer sure. to kind of figure out roles and responsibilities. <laughs> maybe they use those first four weeks to experiment a little bit. Um, but whatever the, you know, however it works out, um, they're relatively healthy. There's no real key glaring weakness uh, in terms of a talent perspective. So I think I, you know, I, I'm, I'm down on the Saints defense now. For sure, yeah. without question. Um, but uh, you know the the numbers the numbers tell me this is St. St. Stephen's is not playing well. Um, but of all of the priors, rel- you know that that are kind of pulling from the preseason, that one's the biggest. I mean, that defense should be should be better come weeks come week seventeen. All right, so we are into the Saints and waiting a bit on the Ravens. We'll talk about them in a second, but first, let's get to Tua Tunga Vailoa's debut. It's the Rams at the Dolphins. Rams now three point favorites here. Total is 46 points, and it's Tua's debut. And obviously, he is a very different quarterback from Ryan Fitzpatrick. I think we sometimes have an overinflated view of Ryan Fitzpatrick, personally. Uh, but Tua's a rookie, you know, and rookies, it's, it's tough to adjust the NFL with no preseason. So. How are you adjusting your view of this team with Tua starting instead of Fitzpatrick? Yeah, it's I can't realistically come up with a prior for Tua just because we haven't even seen him take a you know take a meaningful right. snap in the NFL at this point, uh, and so I, I'm mostly staying away from this game. Although I do think there's a decent second half angle, I'll just kind of stick to the big picture here with the Dolphins, which is you know at at three and three. Um, and the, you know, Brian, Brian Fitzpatrick was performing at a top 10 level the day yeah. I would tell you, uh, and would, was that going to last all season? Probably not. Right. right. I mean, it's, it's, he, he has a very cyclical nature to his, uh, <laughs> his NFL history that would tell you that, you know, you may be at the top at this point and that it was going to go down at some point in the future. Um, but, uh, and, and Tua, uh, you know, I get why they're doing what they're doing. This is, a, it's a really important organizational decision to find out what you have in that player. Because they are the they are, they effectively control uh, the 2021 draft, yes. given how much draft capital they have from the Texans. So, um, to the degree that they need to know as soon as possible whether Tua is their quarterback of the future, they better get him starts. Um, and the obviously the biggest question about him, even more so than his quality of play, I would say, is his ability to stay healthy. Uh, and so you can't just you know throw him in out there week twelve and you know get a four or five game sample and make any sense out of that. You really need to see him be able to do it week in week out and uh, you know show you that his hip is fully healthy and that he can uh, you know play at this level uh, mm-hmm. just physically. Um, and and this is an extremely tough test. There's no doubt about it. The Rams are at least based on the way that I, uh, you know, crunch the numbers, they're performing at a top five level in the NFL right now. And a lot of that is on the basis of they have the best player on defense across the entire NFL and Aaron Donald. I don't think that's really controversial. Um, you know, maybe he's in the conversation with, uh, you know, miles Garrett this year, or TJ Watt, but, uh, Aaron Donald is, is such a, such a unique force and such a difficult uh, player to defend. And he's going up against an offensive line that coming into the season, I would have had in the bottom five, 
And yeah, they've played better than that, but uh, it's still very young, very inexperienced, and they certainly haven't ever gone up against an Aaron Donald. So um, I, I'm a little concerned about uh, how much time two is going to have to be able to operate in this one. I'm not especially in love with the fit of you know his game uh, with what would be uh, you know a quick passing, you know get the ball out of your hands quickly and you know neutralize the pass rush through that mechanism. Uh, so I'm I'm cool on the Dolphins and Tua for now. Uh, that you know until we until we see something that says otherwise and I that would all support well why aren't you betting the Rams then this week and I would tell you well uh, they are really subject to one of the more brutal uh, scheduling quirks across the entire NFL in terms of travel Um, a lot of people have probably talked about this already this week but if you didn't already know this is their fourth trip east uh, in just eight weeks and uh, really in just the last seven weeks. Um, and this is their fifth game in, on the road in the last seven. And that's tough. I mean, it's, it's a really uh, difficult, um, you know, it's really difficult to properly account for how much potential fatigue has built up with these guys doing all of this travel. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm prepared to see them look a little sluggish, look a little slow coming out of the gate, especially because they just played their last two games in prime time. And now here they go, you know, at 10 in the morning Pacific time, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm going to hold off uh, and try to find a good uh, approach to back the Rams in the second half of this game. Because either way, if the if the Dolphins are up, the Rams, you know, the Dolphins pass, uh, excuse me, the Dolphins uh, rush attack doesn't scare me to the tune of they're going to be able to put away, the, you know, run away and hide and put away this game and shorten this game. Uh, Rams are going to be able to have a comeback in them. Uh, and if the Rams are up at halftime, uh, you know, I really I've, I don't have a ton of respect for the for the uh, Dolphins rush defense. Uh, and I could see the Rams, uh, you know, doing the same sort of thing that they did to the Washington football team where they just put their foot on their throat. So I'm going to back the Rams in the second half, regardless of game state, probably. Excellent. Uh, let's get, go over to Steelers at Ravens. Probably my favorite game uh, for the week. Uh, Ravens are minus three and a half total at forty six and a half. And, uh, you know, the Steelers' defense is incredible. Uh, the Ravens' offense has uh, not been what it was last season. So what are you seeing in this game? I would actually even say as credible as the uh, Steelers' defense is, uh, the Ravens are outplaying them defensively. Ravens are outplaying uh, almost everyone right now. Yeah, they are. I mean, they are on an they and you know, and this shouldn't be surprising because it was a good defense last year. They have a good scheme. Yep. Um, and – they added parts to this yeah. defense in the form of Kalei Campbell and now Yannick Ngakwe. And, and uh, you know, they drafted, uh, you know, linebacker in round one. Uh, Marlon Humphrey has taken another step forward, maybe, you know, top three cornerback in the league. Uh, all, all told, scheme and uh, personnel, this is a fantastic unit. Um, and they're going to need their best performance to beat the Steelers, in my opinion, because it, but it, it is strength of the defense against strength of uh, Pittsburgh, which is to say Pittsburgh has this diverse set of weapons in the passing game. And I, I'm expecting Deontay Johnson goes. I'm expecting uh, Juju goes uh, and that they, you're going to have four uh, potential you know threats in the passing game that you're going to have to be aware of. Um, but you have depth and personnel in the, you know, in the secondary for, uh, Baltimore, which is huge. They haven't, you know, not a lot of teams that, that, that Pittsburgh has gone up with can match them strength for strength in that regard. Um, so I think that this is going to be, um, you know, a very hard fought, uh, you know, hard fought contest Steelers offensively to really do much of anything that like, especially since, uh, you know, pe- people will point to, well, Ben Roethlisberger is great you know, when he's been blitzing and he's getting the ball out of his hands a heck of a lot faster this year than we've seen in years past. And that's absolutely true. Um, But he's also a lot less mobile than he's been in years past. And I would even argue less able to just kind of flick guys off and stand in the pocket and, you know, be able to uh, deliver a strike down the field. Uh, So the blitz happy, uh, you know, Ravens attack kind of coming in on him and making, you know, making game changing stops through uh, sacks and fumbles and things like that, I think is a real factor in this one. So uh, if there's an edge in that matchup, I slightly lean towards uh, Baltimore's defense. And then you mentioned it, Ed, the Baltimore passing offense is not good right now. I I don't know what they were thinking in the off season, not trying to upgrade this wide receiver unit. Uh, clearly they have a higher evaluation of Marquise Brown than I do and miles Boykin than I do and Willie Sneed than I do. Um, but to this point in the season, it is one guy 
who is drawing any attention from defenses and in, uh, in the passing offense. And it's Mark Andrews. And he, in the red zone, has cement hands from time to time. So it's, <laughs> it's really not um, dynamic at all in the passing attack. And that also presents a problem because we know – that Lamar Jackson has a one weakness in his game, which is make him throw down the sidelines past 10 yards. And he's going to, you know, he's going to be a little, um, you know, unsure of himself in those moments. And he's going to air some balls out that should, you know, that, that should be, uh, you know, players should be able to make a, a catch on. And Oh, by the way, his wide receivers aren't getting separation there anyway. So it's uh, it, it, that is definitely sort of, um, a concern as far as, you know, a future Ravens backer potentially. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but they, you know, they do have one advantage uh, with when their offense is on the field. And that's that, you know, Pittsburgh's defensive line is very aggressive. It's they're likely going to, you know, they, they you can't do what you just did against Derrick Henry versus Lamar Jackson and expect that to work because Lamar Jackson's going to be able to, you know, flip, you know, he, he can make some, you know, art, you know, he can make some decisions about, uh, you know, whether he's going to keep it and run. Uh, they're going to have some nice, you know, design run schemes. I'm sure they're going to show us some wrinkles we haven't seen so far this season. Um, but they are going up against a formidable unit. There, I would expect the Steelers can take, um, you know, take Mark Andrews out of this game and really make it. Uh, you know, if you're going to if you're going to beat us, you're going to do it on the ground with misdirection and with some, you know, you, some of your best plays. Uh, and but so either way, I, I see advantage for both defenses when it all comes down to it. Um, slight advantage for Baltimore in terms of coaching, slight advantage for Baltimore in terms of se- special teams. Uh, and so I think the line is fair. I would have probably made it three. So three and a half, maybe a little bit of an edge on Steelers. Um, but I think the total, especially the opening total, was just way too high. I think yeah. this is much more of a field position game, much more of a field goals uh, instead of touchdowns. And, uh, you know, all of the edges that I was mentioning that I think favor both defenses amplify that in the red zone. Um, yeah. And I, I just have a very tough time seeing how this turns into a shootout. And I mean, in, in years, it, 46 may feel like a low total in today's NFL, but I mean, realistically, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that's not, uh, that's not all that high uh, in the last five years worth of data, especially uh, considering there might even be a little bit of weather at factor. So yeah. um, under, under in this game, I think is the right play. So it was 49. It's now 46 and a half. That's still high enough where you're willing to go under on that one? Yeah, I mean, you're crossing a couple of key numbers in there, but nothing that I would really be super scared about. I mean, the okay. highest frequency totals we're seeing landing nowadays in the NFL are 44, 51, 55. So there's kind of a mushy area there yeah. in the 40s. And I, I, wouldn't put, I wouldn't put probability of landing on 47, 48. Um, or 49, I wouldn't put probabilities any higher than about two, three percent on any of those. So you're losing, uh, you know, you're losing cumulatively about five percent given sure. the move. Um, but I think I still think you have a, a few percent edge on the under at 46 and a half. This is the benefit of your range of outcomes, uh, the way you do your models. So that's it's fun to hear. Let's move now to the 49ers at the Seahawks. The Seahawks two and a half point favorites. Now the total here is 54, and the 49ers offense they're banged up. There's no Debo here. The running backs for however much that matters they're banged up too but the Seahawks can't stop anybody so I don't know if it matters <laughs> so do you see the 49ers putting up points here despite all the injuries I don't actually and okay it's largely because this is now the I guess the one thing that I have confidence that Seattle can do defensively is stop the run sure and uh and if you can turn um, you know, if you can turn San Francisco into a one dimensional offense where all of the weight of the world is on Jimmy Garoppolo to make crisp passes, ah, give me the Seahawks every time. <laughs> uh, realistically, like I, I'm, I, I like Jimmy G as a quarterback. He's a fine guy to build your franchise around. He's obviously dealing with some health issues this season. Um, but uh, if you can specifically, you know, make him uh, make him beat you down the field with the passing attack. Uh, with a set of wide receivers that really doesn't have a game changer. I mean, George Kittle is obviously a game changer, but he's a tight end. Uh, And so you can at least put a couple of hats on him. Uh, And I would say, uh, you know, Debo Samuel, not expecting him to go. Uh, Jamal Adams, I think, may go. Um, And I think really all the injury information that we have to this point in the season would tell me that, uh, you know, Seattle is the more healthy team. On top of this, San Francisco just flew across the country to play New England, played their one of their best games, if not, I think their most complete game from whistle to whistle. Uh, Their first half against the Rams was better, probably. But the most complete game they played was against the Patriots last week. And you're getting a little bit of a market um, sell high on the Niners right now and a little bit of a market buy low on the uh, Seahawks. Uh, The Seahawks absolutely should have won that Sunday night football game. I have no idea how 
I'm uh, very aware only, they should have won that only, game. It was not, not it was not they, enjoyable. <laughs> I, I have no idea how they lost, let alone didn't cover the three yep. and a half. Like that should have been <laughs> in every three, way, except, shape, and form. Certainly didn't help. They certainly didn't, but uh, a couple of fluky penalties that were completely out of their control. I guess out of the control of the Cardinals who end up winning, right? Yeah. Like, you know, the Seahawks did some, some boneheaded things, I guess. Um, but uh, ticky tack personal foul call that extended a drive, the, you know, the, the, the field goal attempt penalty was, you know, completely unnecessary. And then uh, of course the one that took the, uh, the, what would have been the game winning touchdown off the board. He didn't, you didn't need to be holding in that spot. So uh, it was a, it was a frustrating loss for the Seahawks. I think they bounced back uh, and I laid the three here. Um, got a great number. I, 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 blown away that this got bet down across three at some spots uh, as no someone who had no. D- <laughs> i had dk metcalf in dfs and the, the seahawks minus three and a half uh, that that holding penalty uh it will haunt me for a very long time yeah i knew a guy that had uh he had longest reception for dk math the dk metcalf like over 30 something yards for a yeah. huge price uh, he had over receiving yards, which was what seventy something ish yeah. that would have gone over with that completion. That yeah, that was a real bummer. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think the reason to move that way is because like San Francisco has performed really well this year, sure. right? And by my sure. metrics, like better than Seattle, despite how explosive they've been on offense. But you have to recognize like the 49ers are seriously banged up and probably playing over their level, right? And I think yeah. that's that's yeah. coming in. Like the markets are taking that into consideration. Um, you know, and 49ers have some injuries in the secondary, obviously the long-term one with Sherman, um, but with some of their safeties as well. So, yeah, I think this is a, it's a really interesting game because I mean, I think when I looked at my market numbers, it had Seattle by four. And I think that's where a lot of people are coming from. Cause that's, that's, you know, digging past what you've seen in the season so far. Uh, sure. and I think a Seattle defense that probably shouldn't quite be, shouldn't be quite so awful as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, if. You know, they're they're fu- fundamentally what uh, Hopkins did for Arizona, exposing them. You know what the um, uh, what the Cowboys did with their three wide receivers, and when Dak Prescott was healthy. Um, you know, th- those are the offenses that I'm a little bit more concerned. Um, going Not concerned against. about Kendrick Bourne. <laughs> Not as concerned about Kendrick Bourne. No, Nor am I. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. And, you know, congratulations to Kendrick Bourne for 10 receptions sure. and 180 yards on Sunday. Sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, not, not concerned about him right now. All right. Uh, <laughs> any other games you see as standing out as being good values in week eight, Drew? Um, I put a couple of other ones in play, but the one I guess I would uh, kind of key in on here, I still think Tennessee has value. I bet this at four. I would still play it at five and a half. Uh, this is kind of the blowout of the week as far as I can tell you. Um, and yeah, I was actually looking around for alt markets to see if I could get, uh, you know, some of the, uh, some of the higher spreads here. Cause this is just an absolutely perfect get right spot for Tennessee. Uh, some of the injuries that, uh, matter to, um, an offensive line that was struggling, struggling mightily. The 32nd best offensive line, maybe 31st in the league for Cincinnati Bengals has now lost two starters. Um, and, you know, we haven't well, really seen Well, it's not just Tennessee. starters. It's starters <laughs> yeah. at the two most important positions at, yes, at left tackle exactly. and center. And, like, to me, those exactly. are the two most important spots if you're looking at an offensive line. To lose both at the same time is tough. Yeah, and this is so. So the pass rush for uh, Tennessee has been anemic this year. And when you're a unit that is struggling like that and now you get to go up against – you know, this, the, the worst offensive line in the league with replacement level players, like, you know, these guys got to be licking their chops. I think they're going to have a hell of a day. And on top of that, um, I have no idea, uh, you know, how the Bengals are getting off the field in the second half here. Derrick Henry is going to run a muck in the second half. DJ reader is kind of the only guy who I think is a reasonable run stopper for, uh, for Cincinnati. Geno Atkins can generate pressure, but he's not a uh, especially good run stopper in my opinion. And I don't even know if he'll play because he's on the trading block. So he's been playing it's... like 25% of the snaps anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. So not a great, not a great, uh, not, you know, if you're trailing by two scores in this game and you're Cincinnati, I'm not exactly sure how you are getting the ball back. Uh, this feels pretty one way to me, uh, and I think Tennessee gets this done in style. So that's probably my favorite look of the week. Yeah, the Bengals injury situation, the trade situation, it is not great uh, for this specific matchup with Tennessee. That is Drew Dinzik. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at whale underscore capper and check out the Deep Dive podcast as well. Drew, we appreciate the time. Good luck to you in week eight and with all your other stuff, and we'll talk to you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you guys again for having me, and best of luck this week. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah.
covering the future. Big thank you once again to Drew Dinzik for stopping by and spreading his knowledge about week number eight in the NFL. And it's always fun to talk to Drew. I love the way he analyzes things from a schedule perspective with the futures market and all that. He always knows the peaks and the values for each team, but just a really diverse knowledge set when it comes to Drew talking about the NFL. Yeah, I mean, Drew's this earthquake engineer and, you know, <laughs> runs these numbers with Z value, Z scores and, and everything like that. And we can get deep into that. But what, you know, when you talk to him, he's got a lot of knowledge about yeah. uh, what's actually going on, what's going on yeah. underneath those numbers, uh, coaching tendencies, individual players and things like that. And um, so, you know, I mean, there's like a spectrum of kind of numbers, guys. But, you know, I had Rob Azola on my podcast and, you know, he was talking a lot about, yeah, I run my numbers and yes, I use them. Um, but he's he's also happy to go with what he sees uh, on the field. And, uh, yeah, I always think that's interesting. You know, I tend to lean more on my numbers. Um, Rufus Peabody tends to lean a lot on his numbers as well. Um, so just a, just a spectrum. But I do, I do definitely respect what Drew and, and Rob do uh, in terms of really digging into the game. Well, I mean, with I think that's the thing that I like about Drew so much is that you can tell how much knowledge he has about both. Because yeah. he has this, I know that you talked about it, uh, talked, we talked about it too. Like the way he runs his numbers is like he actually runs the probabilities of right. things getting across numbers. He doesn't have a median number. It's the probabilities that numbers get across different numbers. And that's just, it's such yeah. a smart way to do things. So obviously there's a lot of math knowledge involved there, which probably comes from his day job, like you said, uh, studying earthquakes and stuff. Uh, right. But he can tell that he's watching these games and getting knowledge and getting information from the, that as well. And yeah. it's nice to know how deep that knowledge goes in both departments. Cause that's, that's valuable Intel to have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I think models are useful and models can be a good tool for stuff, but like you, you, you must understand the limitations of right. those or you end up with things like the 2008 financial crisis. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think it's really important to, to understand the game. And, and, you know, I mean, personally, I watch a lot of football. I do, but yeah. um, I don't as much as those two. So yeah. I really respect that. And I think the key thing is, is at least for me in watching games, is I can better, better know context. I can get context from numbers. So, like, I just need to know where to look. And watching games helps me know where to look. And I think that's yep. uh, a really yep. helpful thing for me. So let's move into covering the future for week number eight. Starting off with you, Ed, you're talking about a game that I think is going to be a delight to watch on Sunday. At least I hope it is. That is the Raiders <laughs> against the Browns. I know this isn't, like, the most exciting game overall. But right. I find both teams to be exciting because their defenses suck. And I think bad defense is great. So uh, what are you seeing in this game between the Raiders and the Browns? Yeah, so that's interesting. So one of my notes I have here is that, yeah, the Las Vegas defense doesn't seem good. I, I've talked before <laughs> about their pass offense and, and how much respect I have for them and how they're doing well and success rate and that and passing success rate in particular. And that 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 has all persisted. They are very good. They're fourth in my numbers. But the defense, as you said, doesn't look good, right? They're 31st in the NFL when you look at points allowed per game. Uh, but I think that's really deceiving because when I look at my adjusted success rate, they're 17th. So they're they're very league average. And I think what happens, do you remember they had that stretch of game where they lost five fumbles? <laughs> I think they 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 were the defense got some pretty poor field position there. Um, yeah. you know, stuff that you just can't do much about. Um so, you know, big discrepancy in terms of points allowed per game and where they are in my adjusted success rate. Now, I don't think this is a good defense, but um it's not it's not terrible. Um Oh, so let's look at Cleveland. Um, you know, by by those numbers, like Baker Mayfield's looking much better than than he did last year. Last year, in my adjusted passing success rate, they were twentieth. They're moved up to tenth this season. So definitely, things are looking in the right direction. Uh, except the you know the defense has been terrible. Um, so they're uh, worse than the league in my adjusted success rate. So again, probably a game with a lot of points. But what I really see in this game. Um, is that the data from this year really favors Las Vegas. And one of the reasons is because of strength of schedule, right? So think about who these teams have played. Cleveland has got Cincinnati twice, Washington, and Dallas. So bottom, bottom feeder teams, um, okay, and we, we do need to acknowledge that they've, they've also played two of the best teams in Pittsburgh and, and Baltimore as well. Um, but look at who Las Vegas has faced, right? So they've gone up against New Orleans, got the win there. Kansas City got the win there. Tampa Bay, uh, did not get the win there. 
Um, so their kind of easiest game was like against Carolina. That yeah. is a team that we expected to be terrible, but like has shown a lot of life on on offense at least. So, um, so so anyways, uh, I'm I like I like Las Vegas in this game. I'm sorry, I'm trying to look at what my prediction says, but it definitely favors uh, Las Vegas plus two and a half. Yeah, and um. You know, you know, OBJ is not going to play in this game. You know, but Baker's not going to have his his primary weapon as well. That just le- makes me lean even more uh, that way. So, but anyways, I like Las Vegas, and a big part is the strength of the schedule adjustments that that I do. Yeah, and like the interesting thing about that is the Browns have been very schedule dependent because you mentioned they faced Pittsburgh and Baltimore. Like, what happened in those games is they got absolutely rocked. They've been. Yeah very much dependent on their situation. And that gets tougher when you lose a guy like Odell Beckham. I know they played really, really well against Cincinnati, and Cincinnati, you know, (laughs) they're terrible. But, like, that does not mean you should expect their offense to be better going forward when you lose someone who's objectively a good football player in Odell Beckham. Like, one game, 22 or 25 dropbacks is different than the next eight games without Beckham. Like you can do well in that small sample and right. still not expect them to get better. And I think that's been a narrative that has kind of floated this week that maybe they'll be better without Beckham. I have a really, really hard time believing that because yep. I think he's a good football player. And this is a bold statement, but losing good football players is a bad thing. It's a bad thing. So, oh, let's I, it, so my numbers have Cleveland by about a half point. Okay. So, yeah. A tight game. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that number, but uh, the data from this season is certainly in favor of Las Vegas and pushing my prediction towards that. And I think the good thing with Las Vegas is they've always graded out well in a success rate perspective, but their ability to generate big plays is better with Henry Ruggs healthy, and he's been healthy sure. the past two games, so that should make them higher upside too, which I find really intriguing. Uh, let's move now to that uh, Pittsburgh versus Baltimore game. I actually do have a play in this game, and I like the Ravens minus 3.5. And, and this game opened at 5.5, so there's been some pretty heavy, heavy movement towards uh, the Steelers here, and I think that's fair enough. Uh, and it makes sense. I can understand why, because of the conversation we've had about this Ravens passing offense not being the best. So clearly there's been a lot of money on the Steelers potentially recognizing that that Ravens offense hasn't been that great. But the reason that I want to go with the Ravens here is the other side of the football, talking about this Ravens defense against the Steelers offense. And after adjusting for schedule, the Ravens rank second in overall defense according to number fires metrics. They are fourth against the pass, first against the rush. So either direction, they've been awesome. The Steelers look good on paper offensively because they are fourth, or sorry, they're sixth in points per game this season. That's an awesome number. You want to rank well there. But Drew kind of alluded to this. They faced a lot of really bad teams. If you look at their opponents' defensive rankings so far this year, in order, their opposing defenses have ranked 23rd overall defensively, 6th, 29th, 19th, 28th, and 20th. So the Browns have faced a good schedule, like uh, a, an easy schedule, but the Steelers has actually been easy, even easier. So you kind of expect them to put up points against those teams. Once you adjust for that schedule, the Steelers' offense actually ranks 13th by number fires metrics, so they're not bad, but I'm curious if they're good enough to move the ball against this specific defense. Baltimore's offense has not been anything special so far this year. They're actually worse than the Steelers uh, by number fires metrics, but if I were betting on a bounce back, betting for regression on any offense— I'm going to bet on the Ravens rather than the Steelers in this specific game. I'd rather bet on Lamar Jackson right now than Ben Roethlisberger. So as of right now, three and a half is the best number that you can get. Uh, According to odds fire, I'm willing to fire at that number and bank on a bounce back here for the Ravens. I am okay laying three and a half and getting some action on a game that should be pretty fun to watch. Uh, But Ed, what do your numbers say here about the Ravens and the Steelers? Yeah, I mean, my numbers have it exactly three and a half. So okay. <laughs> I'm happy with that. Because I find it hard to, you know, sidewise, I find it hard to, I mean, I think Baltimore slipped from last year. I think we yeah. see that, what happened with their offense. I think Pittsburgh's rising. I mean, the defense has been awesome. Um, still some questions about them on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, so, you know, when you put those all together, you kind of land on exactly where the market is. I'm, I'm kind of ambiguous on the side. Um, but as we talked about, like, I think the under, I, I think I, I like the under in this because 
because I think the defenses are really good. I think it's right. going to be like a field position game, as Drew said. Drew had that one too. So under 46 and a half for both Ed and Drew. And I will take the Ravens minus three and a half. Hopefully this game, you know, plays out uh, where it's close because it would be a fun one to watch. We can get four quarters of good football from Lamar Jackson and the Steelers defense. That is all that we have for today. But as mentioned, this was our second show of the week. So make sure you go check out our episode with Eli Hershkovich breaking down week number nine in college football. You can get that by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please make sure you subscribe and leave a rating and review as well. We always appreciate it. That does help us out quite a bit. Ed, what is going on for you at the Football Analytics Show and at thepowerrank.com? Yeah, absolutely. Trying to write about my analytics on my free email newsletter. Uh, I've gotten some nice unsolicited feedback on that this season, which you can check out and sign up for at thepowerrank.com. And great conversation with Rob Pizzola on the Football Analytics Show. Rob is uh, one of the best in the business, so definitely don't want to miss that. I always like listening to Rob, so I'll be sure to check that out. And always a, yeah. a good time for sure. So Rob, uh, Rob hates... Uh, New uh, Boston sports teams. So uh, you, I got to ask him whether he, he liked closing line value or watching the Patriots lose more, which was oh, fun. <laughs> That's really I funny. Got yes. from, I got this from Nick Costos. He threw, he, he did this like what, whatever you prefer at me. One of the times I was on, uh, yeah. on uh, you better, you bet. And uh, so when I have a guest on for the, however, you know, the, the multiple times, someone I know pretty well, like yeah, I've yeah. Been doing that just three of them at the end. And I've, I've got some good ones. I got wow. Bill Connolly to yell at me for <laughs> making him pick between the Sun Belt and the Bundesliga. Wow. <laughs> he was, yeah, he wasn't happy about having to answer that. <laughs> but, I would say that Rob's having a great year with the Patriots being down, but I, he's a Cowboys fan, right? He's a Cowboys. Yeah, I should have. I should, we should have talked about that more. Yeah, he is a Cowboys fan. Poor Rob. The one year he can he can be happy about the Patriots losing and he loses Dak Prescott. So uh, pour one out for Rob and uh, make sure you check him out on the Football Analytics Show. Check out Ed uh, thepowerrank.com and also at the Power Rank on Twitter. I am at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. We also had our DFS podcast earlier today. That went up on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed with myself and Brandon Gadula breaking down the Week Eight NFL DFS slate. There is a lot of wind to consider on that slate. We discussed. Uh, what the data says about wind and how much that impacts quarterback performance and stuff for running backs and receivers as well. Find that on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. Also make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread and follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for one of the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. Thank you to Drew Dinsick and Eli Hershkovich for being our guests this week. And good luck to all of you with your bets in college football and the NFL. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>